Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have been linked to heart inflammation. In rare cases over the last few months, and now the CDC has clarified the issue. Here are the details. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has updated its advice to say males between 12 and 39 might consider waiting eight weeks between first and second doses of Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines to reduce still rare risk of heart inflammation. The increase on the minimum approved interval of three and four weeks, respectively, comes in the wake of several studies linking those vaccines to increases in rates of pericarditis, inflammation of the outer lining of the heart, and myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle. While incidents of COVID-19 associated cardiac injury or myocarditis are estimated to be 100 times higher than those related to vaccines, and the latter symptoms are usually far milder and resolve within weeks, a Nature Review's cardiology study suggests one possible mechanism behind the issue is that the immune system might detect the messenger RNA in the vaccines as an antigen, resulting in the activation of pro-inflammatory cascades and immunological pathways in the heart. As so-called mRNA vaccines, both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines package messenger RNA, or the genetic sequence of the novel coronavirus, into a lipid nanoparticle carrier in order to program cells to reproduce the coronavirus spike protein so that it can later be recognized by the body's immune system should it come into contact with the actual virus. For now, though, there are several active theories about how this process could trigger heart inflammation, with the increased incidence among male patients also suggesting hormone signaling might be involved. Overall, CDC advice remains straightforwardly in favor of COVID-19 vaccination for everyone aged 5 years and older in the United States. A large study of post-mRNA vaccine myocarditis cases in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that even the highest reported rates in adolescent males aged 12 to 15 years after the second vaccination dose of Pfizer saw just 70.73 cases per million doses of the vaccine. There were also no confirmed cases of myocarditis in those who died after mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccination without another identifiable cause. Further useful context for this story is that myocarditis can also be caused by a whole host of other more mundane factors, from the virus that causes the common cold to fungal infections, according to the Mayo Clinic. And most cases of myocarditis are self-resolving, according to the director of cardiac sarcoidosis at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Why Oxford AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine can cause blood clots is a question that has been asked for months now, and scientists may finally have an answer. Here's what you need to know. The trigger for rare blood clots occurring in patients who receive the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine may be a type of protein in the blood that is attracted to one element of the vaccine, according to a new study in the Science Advances Journal cited by the BBC. The University of Oxford's vaccine uses a genetically modified common cold virus from chimpanzees to carry blueprints for the coronavirus's spike protein. This virus vector then helps program an immune response against a real coronavirus. The new study found that if the vaccine enters the bloodstream, it can attract a type of protein called platelet factor 4. From there, in extremely rare cases, the body's immune system can confuse platelet factor 4 for the virus vector and release antibodies to attack it. When this happens, the antibodies and platelet factor 4 can cluster together, resulting in blood clots. The BBC points out that vaccine-induced clots like these have been linked to just 73 deaths out of nearly 50 million doses of AstraZeneca given in the UK, while AstraZeneca said the vaccine is thought to have saved more than a million lives around the world and prevented 50 million cases of COVID. The clots are more likely to occur because of a COVID infection than the vaccine, according to a spokesperson for the company. An mRNA vaccine is based on the genetic sequence of the novel coronavirus and not the actual virus. mRNA is short for messenger RNA. Pfizer and BioNTech's SARS-CoV-2 vaccine uses the genetic blueprint for the spike protein that coats the virus, according to information published on Pfizer's website. The spike protein is used to synthesize an mRNA sequence. This is packaged into a lipid nanoparticle carrier. Lipid nanoparticles protect the mRNA from degradation inside the body and facilitate its delivery to the targeted cells. The lipid nanoparticle carrier transfers the mRNA and its copies of genetic instructions to the cytoplasm of a cell, where the ribosomes are found. Once inside the cell, the mRNA instructs the ribosomes to produce the coronavirus's spike protein. By itself, the spike protein is harmless. The spike protein is then displayed on the surface of the cell. This simulates a coronavirus infection, thus triggering the body to mount an immune system response. COVID-19 variant Omicron's attempt to take over the world is being helped by a surprise trait. 
Here's what's happening. Precise structural changes to the Omicron variant spike protein have been identified that mean it is capable of breakthrough infections that afflict both vaccinated people and those who have previously been infected, according to a new study in the journal Science, which looked at the variant's ability to both evade antibodies that protect against previous variants and still remain highly infectious. The infectiousness of the variant is in part determined by the 37 mutations in the amino acid sequences of its spike protein that distinguish it from the virus strain discovered in Wuhan. These mutations have been shown to help the variant evade antibodies generated by the six most commonly used vaccines and all but one of the monoclonal antibodies used to counter infections, as the mutations also affect the structure of the region of the spike protein responsible for attaching to and entering cells, a trade-off had been expected where they might simultaneously restrict the variant's ability to bind to target cells. The new study used cryo-electron microscopic and X-ray crystallographic studies to get an extremely detailed view of the Omicron spike protein and reveal that the proposed trade-off does not apply to it. The mutations do indeed change how the protein interacts with antibodies so that the ability of almost all monoclonal antibodies against it is reduced, but at the same time, the ability of the spike's receptor binding domain to bind to human cells at the ACE2 receptor is actually enhanced, so it is able to bind even more tightly. The Science Study's lead author, cited by SciTech Daily, summed up the situation like so. This virus has incredible plasticity, he said. It can change a lot and still maintain all the functions it needs to infect and replicate. He added that it's almost guaranteed Omicron is not the last variant we're going to see. The European Parliament voted on June 9th to approve the use of digital COVID certificates to travel within the EU. And it's now up to member states to choose which rules they'll apply. Currently, travelers need to undergo COVID testing and quarantine almost every time they cross a border within the EU. Ideally, the certificate would allow carriers to simply scan and go, rather than test and wait. Here are the details. CNN reports that the EU has voted to approve the EU Digital COVID Certificate, which should allow easier movement between EU countries. The scheme is scheduled to start on July 1st. The certificate is touted as a way to make travel within Europe much easier. Currently, if you travel between two EU countries, you'll have to meet each of their individual rules for entry, which might mean daily testing if you're driving through or taking the train around the continent. The certificate will log three things, the holder's vaccination record, negative tests, and a record of previous infection. In participating countries, the certificate should allow carriers to simply scan and go. It should eventually be valid in all EU member states plus Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. Switzerland is also looking likely. Travelers can choose a paper or digital certificate, and EU countries are urged to not add extra requirements for entry, although it is conceded that in some cases, countries might still require additional testing. Only vaccines approved for use in the EU will count, so Sinovac or Sputnik V, for example, wouldn't count. At least, that's the block-wide rule, but individual countries can tweak the rules. Currently, the EU has approved vaccines from AstraZeneca, Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. As of June 8th, there were only nine EU states signed up, those being Bulgaria, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Germany, Greece, Lithuania, Poland, and Spain. CNN says it expects the other 18 nations to join soon. So far, eligibility is for EU citizens and their families, plus legal residents. However, an EU spokesperson told CNN that the EU expects to open the scheme up to non-citizens, including Americans. The major maker of COVID-19 vaccines says it will ship pre-manufactured factories to African countries so that African countries can produce their own COVID-19 vaccines. Currently, only a small fraction of Africa's people have been vaccinated against the virus. Here are the details. The Associated Press reports that vaccine maker BioNTech unveiled plans on Wednesday, February 16th to ship pre-manufactured COVID-19 vaccine factories to Africa. These factories are modular units that are pre-fitted with all the equipment required to make COVID-19 vaccines. Each factory is separated into 12 modules that are each the size of a standard shipping container. The 12 containers will be shipped to a port nearest to the target site, where they will be placed on trucks and transported by road to the site. There, the containers will be assembled into two separate units made up of six containers each. The first unit is where the substances are prepared. This is where the mRNA material is produced before it is purified and concentrated. These prepared substances are then moved to the second unit, where the substances are combined so the drug can be formulated. 
The last step, where the completed product is placed into bottles, labeled, and packaged, will happen in a separate factory that would be owned and operated by local partners. BioNTech says the first factory will be shipped to either Senegal or Rwanda in the second half of this year. The company aims to start production of up to 50 million doses of vaccine a year within the next 12 months. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.